encounters improve the quality of our lives. Encounters come to reveal to us the futility of life without God. Encounters will activate purpose and calling in our life. Encounters come to restore intimacy and fellowship. The land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw a great light, and to them which sat in the region and the shadow of death, light is sprung up. Encounters come to restore intimacy. Encounters come to reveal to us the futility of life. If you don't have a relationship with God, anything of value can become God to you. Welcome to Encounter Jesus Ministries, sustaining an experiential knowledge of God and walking in the fullness of our eternal ordination. Now, listen to God's servant, Apostle Oropo Michael, as he takes us through an encounter with the Word. Father, we thank you this morning. Our hearts are open to receive. We ask that you bless us with your word and your presence. Even this morning. Even as you lift us to higher realms. Higher pedestals in the spirit. To see from higher planes. And to legislate your counsel from higher dimensions. Take all the praise. They call the glory in the name of Jesus. to stir the waters before we share the word is for number one our hearts to be open to receive the word of the Lord is not basically a scholastic expression of God's wisdom and intelligence the word of God is truth and so you don't receive truth in your brain. You receive truth in your heart. And so if the waters are not stirred, your mind will supersede and superimpose over your heart. And you'll be interacting with facts and knowledge from a cognitive plane. But you see, when you acquire truth, you don't necessarily become more knowledgeable. When you acquire truth, truth makes you free he said you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free the proof that you know it is that a form of liberty is imparted into you you can know the doctrine of healing and still be sick so what you have is information not truth the moment truth comes to you you will be healed that's what truth does this is why you can sit on one verse of the Bible for 10 years you can memorize it in five minutes, but you may know it in 10 years. Memorizing it gives you information. Knowing it gives you freedom. And so when we come before the word of the Lord, we need to prepare our hearts. That's why we worship God and trouble the waters so that we'll be aligned to receive truth, not just information. And number two, the reason we, we, we provoke the move of the Spirit 
is because we are trusting God that utterance will be granted. Utterance. Utterance is different from the ability to communicate. Oratorial power is not utterance. There are wars in season. When utterance comes, it will shift a people into their season. <laughs> Utterances come to open seasons. They don't come to furnish you with knowledge. And so when you receive an utterance, utterance will shift you from where you are to where you ought to be. So a preacher becomes powerful when utterance are given to him. And so we humble ourselves before the Lord and ask the Lord to help us every time we come. Because we know that without him, we can do nothing. Praise God. And so this morning, I'm persuaded that our hearts are open. And I also believe God will bring all trans. You know, it's not a long message that transforms men. It's not a long message. A long message can become very boring. It's utterance. Utterance is the power of God to communicate his heart to the heart of men. And this morning, I believe God will grant utterance. Hallelujah. Praise God. Minister Michael has opened the dimension of energy. I wish we were to do a revival service this morning. I'd have entered that energy. But since it's a teaching series, though there are two pathways in accessing the realities of God. The first pathway is the pathway of energy. The reason is because God dwells in the realm of power. And so everything God says comes with an energy. And so sometimes when God wants to bring you into reality, he conveys it through energy. He won't talk. Energy will take you there. Elijah was carried by the whirlwind. wind. That's energy. That energy changes things. It can alter you completely. It's just like radiation. When radiation is opened in your direction, it can melt your cells. It can dissipate your cells. And then the second dimension is light. Light may not be very energetic, but it will remove scales from your eyes. Scales. When scales fall off, you will, you will know there was a well and you didn't know. He said, the Lord was here and I knew it not. Light came. And when we are doing a Bible study, we don't go the route of energy. We go the route of light. And so this morning, we will calm the energy down a bit <laughs> so that we can use the path of light. The door he opened is the door of energy. If I enter, I can't teach. I'll talk for five minutes and the hall will explode. But for us to be able to teach, we will need light. So in order to bring us back to the corridor of light, let me teach you a chant that we reduce the energy in your, in your, in your soul. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Here, here first. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Is that simple? Did you see the progression? Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, 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 Ay 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 Eh 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 Ay 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 Give the 
Lord a shout. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. You may be seated. I'm going to teach you on the subject I titled this morning The Making of a Minister. Maybe if we have if we have time again, I'm going to talk a bit about the texture of apostolic Christianity. Like God's servant was saying this morning, by the way, let's honor our father this morning, Apostle Francis Hillary Sacofield. Is that how you celebrate a father who has labored in your land? Come on, give the Lord a shout of praise. Hallelujah. Great servant of God, yet extremely humble. It's so difficult to find such a blend in our society today. And we are so honored to be gathering here because of your labors in the kingdom. I honor you deeply from my heart. Thank you, sir, for being genuine, for being honorable, and for modeling the character of Jesus in a time where it's difficult to truly find men that represent the kingdom. One more time, can we clap hands for Jesus, to Jesus for raising this special servant? Praise God. And so this morning, I want us to look at some of the biblical standpoints that makes for the making of a minister, a genuine servant of God. Christianity is being bastardized today. A lot of people are not aware that what we are doing is not a business of men. It's a business of spirits. We were invited to participate and to partner with spirits not to fulfill our own will but to fulfill their will. The component of the will of God that is apportioned to you is what you call your purpose. If he doesn't have a will that he has allowed you to express, you would not have a purpose. And as such, there won't be a need for your existence. And so when you come into time and you think that existence is all about your own needs and your pleasure, then you have not understood why you came in the first place. When Adam was put in the garden, God created an atmosphere that satisfied everything he ever desired. And for a second, Adam felt existence was about himself and about pleasure. He didn't know that he was being brought into a government and a politics of spirits. Before Adam showed up, there was a spirit realm existing in a very legalistic form with spirit entities serving the will of God perpetually until there was war in heaven. And one of the ranking angels decided to rebel against God. And so he created a parallel government. When Adam was introduced to the earth realm, he didn't know that he was in the midst of a battle that was ancient, older than time. Because at the time, time was not yet created. So these were realities that were happening in realms eternal. It is because God wanted another kind of purpose to find expression. That is why he created an envelope called nature. The earth realm, the visible realm, governed by time, space, and matter. And he trapped the man in it so that the man could download eternal purpose from eternal realms and fulfill it in the natural realm that is confined by time and space. And so he was not designed to be creative. He was designed to be yielded. Because the quality of his existence would depend on his ability, number one, to tap into the frequency of God and number two to apply exactly what God reveals to him 
if he does not apply it exactly the way God shows him, the earth will become alien to the heavens. Because what God wanted to do was to mirror the visible realm in the order of the invisible realm. So what made Adam relevant was his ability to download the dimensions of heaven. And that is the summary of our life and our existence on the face of the earth. God has a robust purpose and he decided to split it and give us packets of his will so that as we fulfill it, eventually our corporate existence will translate into the manifestation of that corporate purpose that God has for our generation. And so for a minister to be accurate, his job will be consistent with what Adam had at the beginning. The ability to tap into the mind of God and to download the mind of God. It's like a puzzle. If you fail to do that, no matter what you become, you may be very big among men, but in the realm of spirit, you will be tiny. Because your value in that realm is the degree to which you are able to translate the heart of God into your, your ecosystem. Because when Adam decided to go on his own path, he thought he loved apples. He didn't. His emotions were being manipulated. Because it was the devil that showed him. It was there all along. He didn't know that that appetite existed. But that spirit is older than him. So that spirit was wiser than him. And he showed him the apple and began to suggest to him. If you eat this fruit, you will become like God. He said, even God knows. And the moment those suggestions came into his soul, he began to become creative. To do things that were not in the script. Meanwhile, before he was formed, his destiny was written. Before he was kept in the garden, his purpose was defined. But another spirit came and whispered. The same way spirits are whispering to prophets today. That you know, your prophetic office will not be respected unless you drive a Lamborghini. And what you need to do is that when you buy the Lamborghini, sit on it and open your hand. People will know that you are in command. Meanwhile, the power of a prophet is not mundane. A prophet is supposed to grow until he becomes one of the elders of heaven. That's, that's the authority of a prophet. A prophet is an elder among men. That's why a prophet doesn't speak because he read a book. When a prophet talks, he is penetrating beyond time. He's talking things that are before the foundation of the world. And that's why God sends prophets into territories as quality control agents. Because when the earth begins to lose balance, you will need a prophet to come back and draw the line. A prophet can tell you that before the world was created, this is how God wanted it. Not because he read a book, it's because he can journey through time into eternity and he will bring you the perspective of Zion. Hope you know that Moses was telling us things that happened before men were created. That means by the power of the prophetic, you can go be before the age of man. Because Moses actually traveled beyond the age of man. When he said, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, there was no man. He was operating in the office of a prophet. Because the office of the prophet is older than man. That's why Moses told us how man was created. He said, God gathered the dust from the ground. How can a man be telling you how man was created? Because when you enter the office of the prophet, you come to the assembly of the elders. The elders are the custodians of the secrets of God. When John was carried to heaven in Revelation chapter 5, the Bible said he wept because he didn't see hope for the earth realm until one of the elders came to him and said, Weep not. He said, Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, he has prevailed. So a prophet is an elder in Zion. And the reason he's an elder is because he carries ancient secrets that are older than time. So the authority of the prophet are the secrets that are committed to him, not the car he drives. That's why when Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration, it was not angels that came to him. It was prophets. Prophets came. And he said they were telling him what he will do. Jerusalem because when Jesus became a man he needed the elders to show up and guide him on how to walk as a man
because prophets are elders in Zion. When your prophetic office is accomplished, your rank is that you are enthroned in the world to come. You become an elder. But when you don't know the powers of service and ministry, you will reduce your ministry to the kind of car you drive. The prophets of old, they were so burdened about Zion that they were never part of civilization. And so in those days, when you are looking for a prophet, you will find him in the cave. Because he is having meetings in heaven. Meetings. There are meetings in Zion. They are, they are negotiating about Canada. What will be the move of God in Canada? And prophets are summoned from the earth. And say, what do you think about Canada? When should there be a visitation? Those were the prophets of God. Did you not read that when God was going to destroy Sodom, God said, will I do a thing and not tell my servant Abraham? Because he called Abraham a prophet. And when God showed up, Abraham was negotiating with God about the fate of Sodom. What if you find 50 righteous men? Far be it from you that the righteous God will destroy the just and the unjust. What if you find 50 righteous men? And God said, if I find 50 righteous men, I will spare the land. And when God was going, he said, let my Lord not be offended with me. What if you find 45? What if you find 40? He negotiated the destiny of Sodom until he stopped at 10. That's what prophets do. Prophets are the custodians of the heritage of God in time. So when you find prophets pursuing Gucci watches and wristwatches, pursuing cars, pursuing mansions, you know that those ones are not prophets. They are higher needs. They only have the gift of word of knowledge. Because when a prophet rises, the seal of a prophet is the righteousness that he establishes over nations. The power of a prophet is that he's able to bring righteousness to a nation. Most of the people you call prophets are soothsayers. They are diviners. They are corrupt men. They are in the order of Balaam. Because they pursue gain. Gain. That, that's what they want. Gain. When you see a true prophet of God, his power is righteousness. He can bet righteousness over a nation until when you show up. Did you not read about Elijah on Mount Carmel? He brought down the prophets of Ba, the power and the, the heritage of a prophet are the seals of righteousness that he breaks in heaven until the earth conforms to Zion. We have not had prophets from Southern Africa. We only have gifted men who can see the color of your singlet. When prophets rise, the nation will be purged. The Bible said that, oh, when Jonah entered Nineveh, Jonah, he came in the authority of the prophet. When he entered Nineveh and cried, the king tore his garment. Even the animals in Nineveh fasted in repentance. That's a prophet. When a prophet comes into the land, he comes with a scepter of righteousness. You will see the judgment of God. Judgment, the nation will be purged. You have people showcasing your watch and doing dress code, wearing socks that match their tie, carrying paparazzi around, snapping pictures, and they say, Prophet. The prophets, they know the way of the desert, they know the cave. When they come out, they want to cry. When the prophet comes out, even the kings will know what is the Lord saying. He's coming to cry for a generation to repent. That's the power because he's an elder in Zion. He comes with verdicts, the conclusions of heaven. That's what he brings to men. The conclusions. you know when we are not taught who a minister is we will take pride in the wrong things 
Many prophets come to me, I look at them. I just know they are fake. What I would have done as a minister, if I was protecting my name, is to avoid them. But when I look at the weight of their calling and what they would have been in Zion, I pity them. And they don't know. And so sometimes, because of the love of God, what I do is that I sit them down and I teach them Bible. I say, put your gift in your pocket. Your gift is for babes. Because when a babe doesn't have direction, he will need you to tell him when to travel and when not to travel. When you come among elders, we don't talk gift. We talk your scepter. Where are you operating in Zion? Sit down. I teach them the oracles of God. The oracles. And I've had many prophets lie down in my hotel and weep and repent. Because when I finish talking to them, they will now start confessing that they are rapists. That's when we will forget about the show on the altar. So that we can save their soul. Because if we don't save them, many will follow them to hell. I've had many, they lie down. Because they don't even know who a prophet is. A prophet is supposed to be a wonder. If a generation is blessed with prophets, that generation is blessed indeed. That's why God sends prophets. Because they are a blessing. They are a blessing. And then you come from a region that have heritage, the heritage of prophets. You are supposed to be a blessing to this generation. But if you don't know who a minister is and you don't follow the pathway for the making of a minister, you will waste and violate sacred things. You see all these wolves in sheep clothing. Gather gullible, gullible sisters and tell them when they sleep with them, favor will come on them. A prophet that should pull men from the head, from the pit of Hades. A prophet that should pull nations from the pit of Hades. Begin to lead others to death. And so what I do is when I teach you for a while and you refuse to repent, you are a son of perdition. Then we will judge you. Because an apostle is a judge. Why a prophet is an elder, an apostle is a judge. When we bring the mercy of God and you don't receive it, then we bring judgment. I wish I had time, I would have shown you what will happen in the ages to come. In the ages. In the ages to come, prophets will become elders and apostles will become angels. That's why they are called sent ones. We are high commissioners. We come with the counsel of God. And the counsel of God can be the wisdom of God and it can also be the judgment of God. When John was carried to heaven, he met an apostle like him. He thought he was an angel. He wanted to worship him. He said, no, stand up. I'm one of your brethren. I've come into my celestial dimension. You are still on earth. When you graduate, you come here. We are messengers of heaven. They will send us to different dispensations to carry the counsel of God. And so this morning, in order not to bring judgment on ourselves and on our territories, Let's extray one more time the making of a minister. So that you will know your calling. If you don't know your calling, you will join the crowd. 99 prophets can go the way of Balaam. Be the one righteous man. The Bible said Noah was righteous. Because of him, his generation was judged. One man. One man can become more important than a whole generation. And so when you preach them, preach to them the love of God, and they don't, turn the second side of the, of the sword and bring the judgment of God so that it will be a witness against them that they saw the light, but they choose darkness. Sit down. Let's look at scriptures. Aliyah. <laughs> Aliyah, <laughs> 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 
When John showed up in the New Testament, he said, I write unto the church in Titeria. That's a prophet. He was telling them the conclusions of heaven. Prophets will rise again. Prophets. Genuine prophets. Genuine prophets. They will rise again. <laughs> Genuine prophet. Not wolves in sheep clothing. Looking for gullible people to deceive. Genuine prophets. That will bet the heritage of your continent, your generation, and your territory. Genuine prophet. And some of them are here this morning. There are seven protocols that must be attained for a genuine minister to rise. There are seven. And I will take time to just list them quickly. Then we'll look at them one after the other. Anywhere I stop, the Lord will give us understanding in the name of Jesus Christ. And the reason I'm starting from here is because I already began to mention a few of them last night. The first protocol in the making of a minister is what we call divine encounters. A minister cannot be born except as an encounter is achieved from the realm of God. The second protocol is what we call divine instructions. These are the things that makes for a genuine minister. The third protocol is what we call service unto God. The fourth protocol is what we call the requirements of self-denial. Self-denial. The fifth protocol is what we call engagement in warfare. Every genuine minister fights. is a warrior. In fact, your badge in Zion are a product of the battles you conquer. That's where you know mighty men in the kingdom. They are warriors. They fought battles. The sixth protocol is what we call the supply of the spirit of grace. That's what helps you to represent the spirit. You don't represent the spirit because you are intelligent. You represent the spirit because grace is provided. And the sixth protocol is what we call transition to glory. Operating from the glory realm. I hope you got everything I've said. Now that I'm persuaded that you have, let's look at them one after the other. The church in Nigeria is blessed with certain fathers that went ahead to create the platform for ministry. In fact, we stand today because of their teachings, because of their covenants, and because of their prophecies. That's why when a nation is blessed with genuine fathers, that nation is blessed indeed. Most of the regions and countries where you have hirelings is because they didn't have fathers that labored with God to secure the counsel of God, to enter into covenants with God and to provide prophecies that opens the path for the Asojong. In the Nigerian church, we had a man that came in from the Netherlands. His name was Pa, S.G. Elton. He was the one that prophesied the shape of Christianity in Nigeria. And most of the fathers of the faith today 
were discipled by him. He taught them the way of prayer. And this is why you discover that every time there is about to be a move in Nigeria, the prayer move goes first. Because he placed it as a signature in the foundation of the Nigerian church. And most of the things we hope will happen today were captured in his prophecies. He didn't just call names and phone numbers. He shaped the Nigerian church with his utterances. Another man that did extraordinary well, extraordinarily well for the Nigerian church is Apostle Babalola. He also pioneered the way of prayer and he was a prophet. And it was in his life that the dimensions of the supernatural were manifested. He was a man that could travel by the wind, by location, was natural. So he opened the heart of the Nigerian church to the possibility of walking like an immortal on the face of the earth. And the last among them was Bishop Benson Idahosa. He op opened up the evangelical dimension of Christianity in Nigeria. And this is why you see that God can raise men from Nigeria and send them to different nations of the world. He was the one that pioneered that order. And he demonstrated so much authority through righteous living and prayer. It became a signature of his work with God. And so when you find the Nigerian church, there's a prophetic heritage, there's an apostolic heritage, and there's an evangelical heritage. Because this man created a triangle that the church was built on. Most of the doctrines we teach today derived from their messages and their lives. These men have called, they paid the price to create the foundation for the church. And today when you go to Nigeria, you find their protégés bearing those banners in different dimensions. And so when you are looking for balance, when you look at the life of the leading fathers, you can pick one of the virtues that they picked from this man. You may not be very accurate looking at one of them, but all of them drank from those rivers and they carried measures. And so when you look at them, you can pick those values and they become a pathway. If you are doing anything that is not trapped in any of them, 90% of the time is error. And so when you look at the life of W.F. Kumuye, it's a testimony of holiness purity and righteousness even if he doesn't preach any message his life is too loud the message for you to deny his existence he's a puritan and so in the nigerian church you can't be accurate if your life is not straight if they can find error in you in your character even if your doctrine is correct nobody will believe you because they drank of that river and it is replicated in the life of the fathers when you look at the life of Papa Adeboe, he's a man of humility and meekness. So much temperance, you will see brokenness. The brokenness in him is so loud that everything he does, that signature is on it. And you find this thing littered among the fathers. Some carry the heritage of prayer. Some carry the heritage of wonders. Some carry the heritage of brokenness. And they model to us what was given to them. And so even though God is telling a new move, the values that they offered is a sign of men that God has put his hand on. And these are the things that help us find direction. And so when you find a region where you can't trace such fathers that walked with God and left a legacy, then there's a problem. You have to go back to the scriptures again and begin to find out from the ancient landmarks what are the things that move God. Because some of the things that move men don't move God. And this is where we have problems. We are majoring in the things that move men, not the things that move God. And because our life is full of the things that move men, we have the applause and the approval of men. But when we come into the realm of God, like Isaiah, we will begin to curse ourselves. He said, Woe unto me, I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell among a people that are cursed. He didn't know all of that until the realm of God appeared to him. That was when he discovered that among men he was mighty.
but among the mortars, it was tiny. And so, when you want to find out how ministers are made, you need to find out the things that God himself approves as the standard for raising his ministers. And they came walking in the garden in the cool of the day. So what gave Adam accuracy in the realm of God was the fact that the voice of God came every time in the cool of the day to show him the perspective of heaven. That was why Adam was accurate. And if you notice, the moment Adam went the way of rebellion, that voice was what let him know that, ah, you have erred. That means encounters are God's approach or God's means of fortifying a minister and keeping him accurate. When a minister stops having encounters, is beginning to fall. The assurance that you are accurate is not that men are clapping for you. The assurance that you are accurate is not that you are having more invitations and more visibilities. The assurance that you are accurate is not that your congregation is becoming bigger. Those are earthly parameters. The assurance that you are accurate is that every time an encounter comes, it corrects you and approves you. That's why Isaiah was a prophet for many years. He took an encounter for him to discover that he had swayed from the path of God and his tongue was corrupt. If he didn't see the seraphims, he would not have known that he was a liar because he was the most senior prophet in Israel. Who will correct the most senior prophet? Except us in the corridor of encounter where the ancients appeared and told him, who are you? Immediately, he removed his title as a prophet and kept it aside. He began to call himself a man. Because in that realm, titles don't hold sway. It's purity that defines you. And when he appeared before the seraphims, they were burning with fire. Immediately, he saw iniquity all over him. And he fell down and began to repent. When encounters are gone, accuracy is withdrawn. This is why Eli became inaccurate in the realm of God. The Bible said in 1 Samuel chapter 3 verse 1, he said in those days, the voice of God was cast and there were no open vision. This was why Eli delved into iniquity. They didn't have encounters anymore. And so God was no longer coming to bring quality control to ministry. When a man doesn't have encounter, a time will come, he will become so big because everybody will call him Papa. And he will Papa his way into error. He will papa his way into Hades. But you see, when the immortal spirits show up, they are older than the oldest of men. And so the parameters they present to you, age and time is not one of it. When they check your, 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 your stand, they will see if there is purity. They will see if there is accuracy. They will see if there is love for God. Because when you started, you had a passion for God. They will weigh that fire in your heart. Whether the fire in your heart has gone out, or whether the fire is still there. Those are the parameters they check because they are not coming from a realm where you can intimidate them. They are coming from Zion. They stand in the presence of God. And so no man can intimidate them. So the reason encounters define ministry and the accuracy of a minister is because it is only by encounter that the standard of God can be shown to you. And if you don't see the standard of God again and again, you will drift into error. You will not know. And so every minister that made impact and made impact until they left the earth, they were men of continuous encounters. In fact, you grow based on the level of encounters you have. Your birthday on earth may be calculated into 365 days. Your birthday in the spirit is not calculated into days. It's calculated into the transitions that you have in the spirit. And every time a man sustains an encounter, he has sent to a higher realm. Encounters are the things that make you wise and old in the spirit. Because it brings you the testimonies of light. Our world is not accurate anymore because men don't have encounters again. This is why you see a lot of fraternity, human connection. Because when you see that you are no longer having an encounter to command authority from the realm of God, you will need to stand with somebody else that look relevant. So that you can draw relevance from that person. 
in the days when encounters were common men could decide to separate themselves and be in the wilderness until their day of sowing forth they didn't derive value from other men they derived value from the encounters that they had and so when john came from the wilderness the bible said he was the voice crying in the wilderness he could look at all the pharisees and call them brood of vipers he didn't need human association to build relevance because he was standing with god did you read about elijah he said before god whom i stand there shall be no rain or dew he was not connected to the band of prophets and i'm not saying there's anything wrong with unity when the church gets mature unity becomes one of the signs that we have attained maturity but it is not fraternity in the flesh for self-preservation it is a corporate existence for kingdom authority are we together encounters when they are withdrawn ministers become inaccurate because only by encounter can you see the perspective of god if i ask you today when was the last time you had an encounter you'll be shocked this is why you are now affording to drift into error this is why strange doctrines are beginning to make sense to you because the doctrine are based on human perception not based on kingdom alignment that's why you can hear something that is not consistent with god's nature and you cannot discern it because it's been long you encountered god and so the realm of god has become alien to you anything that looks reasonable you will accept it because encounters are dry encounters are gone when encounters are gone men lose their stand with god i spoke to you about saul yesterday he was killing the church plundering the church in acts chapter 9 verse 4 and 5 as he was going to damascus jesus appeared to him immediately he turned around but he didn't stop there paul continued to have those encounters he said the gospel that i preach he said i was not taught of any man while he was in arabia christ appeared to him he said god himself taught him that gospel and many times you see that the decisions paul took in his ministry were products of encounters at one point the bible said he wanted to go to bithynia to preach the gospel is it okay to preach the gospel is it okay to go to all the ends of the earth yes but god didn't send you to everywhere why paul was going to bithynia he said god resisted him that night he dreamt and he saw a man from macedonia say come and help us so the accuracy in paul's ministry was the product of the continuous encounters that paul had the reason ministers drift into error is because they lose encounters so they substitute stories for encounters that you heard the story of benson in Dahosa does not mean you'll be accurate that you hear the story of the great patriarchs from southern africa does not mean you'll be accurate you need to have your own encounter samuel was in the house of eli he didn't serve god based on what eli told him he had his own encounter and the voice of god gave him everything that he should live by i tell you today many people especially young ministers who want to go into ministry they've never met god they have met men and they take the approval of men to start ministry and so the guy goes for a conference he insists for the prophet to lay hands on him and he snaps the picture he enlarges the picture and puts it in his office so that anybody who sees it we know that this major prophet laid hands on him have you met god they can lay hands on you in a stadium it doesn't mean you are sent it's not men that send men it's god that sends men because when god sends you he gives you a divine mandate jeremiah was the son of a priest he would have become a priest and that would have been a dislocation from destiny it was encounter that revealed to him that although your father is a priest you are not a priest you are a prophet and he was not just called a prophet the kind of prophet he was was told him you are not a prophet after the order of moses you are not a prophet after the order of samuel you are a prophet that you uproot and plant specificity was granted on the mountain of encounters because there are no encounters that's why you have competitions because these guys is gathering ten thousand people in a service you will rent all the billboards you will promote 
all your messages online you will do everything because you think you are relevant based on the size of your congregation if only you had an encounter you would have known that that man is called to a crowd you are called to raise warriors and you cannot raise warriors out of a crowd you may be able to raise only 50 warriors in 10 years your ministries are different that man may have 1 million babies because God called him as a shepherd to provide covering to babes you are not called for babes you are called for warriors your congregation may be 50 but one man from your congregation may be equivalent to 1,000 so those 50 men are 50,000 in the eyes of God if you don't have an encounter you will be dislocated from destiny you want to do what somebody else is doing that one minister is traveling every day does not mean those who travel are those who are approved of God Issachar will prosper in his travels Zebulun will prosper in the tent so why some people are traveling every day some should reject invitations because their ministry is to sit on people so that they mature somebody else's ministry is to travel and set men on fire if you don't have an encounter you'll be dislocated from your destiny that's why you find men lying because one preacher built a 10,000 seater auditorium you too must build one meanwhile God didn't call you to build a, an ultra modern auditorium God called you to raise ultra modern warriors and so why one is building structures which is beautiful you build men the glory of your ministry is different but it will take an encounter to know because one prophet showed up and called the name of somebody's son and called the name of his daughter everybody now wants to call people's names and phone numbers and then when you can no longer do it you now go on facebook and copy people's details and you too will come to church and say you look at somebody's face it resembles what you saw on facebook you now call him and begin to do caricature So churches today, when you come, they say, fill your name outside and where you are coming from. When you fill your name, Osha will quickly go to the back, copy the name, go and check you out on Facebook, get your details, your occupation. Maybe on Facebook, they see you as a doctor. He will come back and call the name. I'm hearing Mufulenga. Who is that? And then you come out, they say, I'm seeing you, you are a doctor in the spirit. You are not in any spirit. You are on Facebook. no encounters and when facebook doesn't work the guy now goes to a native doctor and they wash his face somebody that should win native doctors to the kingdom is now bowing to the altar of a native doctor because he's under pressure his friend is now calling names and phone numbers meanwhile in heaven the equipment they gave you are tools to open the bible your job is to sit down open scriptures so that people can be fed and be strong you leave your tools you want to you too you want to prophesy because you think honor in ministry is a product of word of knowledge no encounters no encounters you will never find rest in ministry until you start having encounters god told you to sing because your brother preached and they called him a great teacher instead of singing you became a rabbi and every doctrine you teach is wrong and you can never see it because you put three clowns around you that when you talk they say oh papa what a revelation there's no revelation there that is a compendium of error You find some people because somebody has prayed for a cripple he walked they come for a meeting people are not yet healed they are lifting clutches so that it will appear online the reason we have many fraud stars is because there are no encounters i read about billy graham billy graham was feeling steadier not one not two not three consistently without miracles it's not miracles that pack out stadium it is 
obeying what God told you to do. Billy Graham was not preaching heavy revelations. He was only preaching the cross. The last crusade he organized, there were people in 18 stadia, 18. People filled stadiums that he was not in. They were watching on screen. In 18 different nations, stadia packed. A man who was not raising cripples. In fact, on one of his crusades, a deaf ear opened. And his people were excited because he operated in the days of men like Ora Roberts. And so they came excitedly and said, we too, the miracles have started. They wanted to take the testimony by all means. He called it a distraction. Because they were not taking the testimony to glorify God. They were taking the testimony so that people will know that in Billy Graham's ministry too, there are signs and wonders. The man knew God called him to win souls to the kingdom. He stayed there. And there is no American preacher that have risen that was honored like Billy Graham. With the likes of William Branham that operated in word of knowledge like a god. The likes of Ora Robert that healed everything that was sickness. None of them was as honored as Billy Graham. He was numbered 55 times in the US Time magazine as one of the most 55 times when he died they placed him where they placed the corpse of American president that died in office they gave him a national barrier both in kingdom and in the world honored him no miracles but he had integrity he had enough encounters with God to only do what God asked him to do today ministers are killing themselves the greatest battle in church is not from the world to the church, it's within the church. Because the house divided against itself cannot stand, the devil knows. And so because he knows we have not encountered God, he brings malice, he brings gossip, he brings backbiting. So ministers are trying to pull ministers down every day. And that you off somebody else's candle does not mean yours will become brighter. Somebody else is not shining because you are not there. He's shining because God decided to put his light on him. And his shine will not stop you from shining. Find yourself in God. A large percentage of the crisis we have in the body of Christ today will end if men began to have encounters. That's why yesterday I labored to show you what to do to have encounters. The first thing to do to walk in encounters is to pick a body for the body when you pick a body for the environment where you live it will attract God to you the second thing to do to have an encounter is to seek the Lord with all your heart in Jeremiah 29 verse 13 he says you shall seek me and find me when you seek me with the whole of your heart when your affection is turned to the Lord God comes in your direction the third thing to do to find encounters is to stand in the presence that is the capacity for prayer and priesthood if you don't have priesthood, you can never have encounters. And the fourth thing to do to walk in encounters is to perpetually serve. Those who serve have encounters naturally. Daniel was in the temple. Samuel was in the temple when God encountered him. Service provokes encounters. So you want encounters? You want to be accurate. And to be accurate, having encounters, you must, number one, have a body. A genuine body to see a change that will affect God's people. Number two, you must seek the Lord with all your heart. Not for what God gives, but for who he is. Number three, you must build capacity to stand always in his presence. He said, I will stand upon my watch and see what he will say to me. And he said, write the vision. The moment you stand, God comes. That's why he told Elijah, go and stand before me on the mountain. God comes when you stand. And number four, when you serve, you have encounters. So instead of being part of this competitive generation, this fleshly generation, this self-preserving generation, doing things in the flesh just to receive human approval, why not see God's appearance? When he speaks to you, listen, the excellency of his spirit is demonstrated when he decides to glorify the very weak common things. 
when the spirit wants to showcase his power he doesn't need a spectacular thing you can be doing what is most unattractive you yet you are the best and people are wondering how it is in that weakness that the excellency can be revealed that's why i said we have this treasure in 18 vessels that the excellence will be of god and not of man i heard someone share a story of a man he has gone to almost every nation of the world what does he do when he comes he begins to talk about his story the same story not modified not edited but this same story. they will invite him everywhere the moment he carries the, the microphone he begins to talk about his story and by sharing this story he has met presidents of nations he has gone around the world sharing his story not many revelations a very boring story but the spirit alighted on it with the pressure is not necessary you need an encounter every great man has encounters moses had an encounter on mount horeb he became mighty isaiah had an encounter in isaiah chapter 6 he became mighty samuel had an encounter in the altar in first samuel chapter 3 he became mighty paul had an encounter on his way to damascus acts chapter 9 verse 4 to 6 he became mighty abraham had an encounter genesis 12 verse 1 to 3 he became mighty everyone that had encounters became mighty ezekiel had an encounter in ezekiel chapter 1 he said i was among the captives by the river Kabah. i saw visions of god he became mighty there is no man who walks in the realm of encounters that is not relevant in this generation the list is endless that means the making of a true minister begins from an encounter because when you have an encounter four things will happen number one your mandate will be given to you you say go to egypt tell pharaoh let my people go that they may serve me you don't have a mandate until you have an encounter number two when you have an encounter your empowerment will be granted the rod of moses became the rod of god he said put that rod you are carrying on the floor he dropped it and it turned to a serpent he said take it by the tail he took it and it became a rod he said put your hand in between your your body he put his hand bring it out it was leprous put it back he put it he brought it out it became normal it was his hand until an encounter came it was his rod until an encounter came pour the water you have on the floor it became blood he said when you go show them these signs the reason you find people doing manipulations is because there are no encounters when god encounters you even your words can become a weapon when you talk the heart of kings will quick when you talk nations will bow because an encounter converts your humanity to divinity number three when you have an encounter the third thing that happens to you is that your security and insurance is guaranteed the reason you find people being priests is because there are no encounters find a man who carries encounters nothing can take him down i keep telling young people we are in a social media age social media is very important because it is an amplifier this message we are preaching here now there are about four to five hundred people here because of social media this message can get to as much as three hundred thousand people in less than two weeks so social media is an amplifier but you need to be understanding and discerning to know that social media is not what ordains you as a minister because if social media makes you it will destroy you the reason you find people trying to build insurance through media and through mundane things is because there are no encounters find a man who has an encounter he is like mount zion that cannot be moved when you try to destroy him it turns out for his good all things will genuinely work together for his good because god becomes his defense jesus said follow me i will make you fishers of men he said let us make man only god makes men so it's important for you to know the difference you can use your social media handles as an amplifier 
but never use the social media as the basis for your making only God through encounters make men so the third thing encounters will give to you is insurance if it is God that spoke to you if it is God that sent you there's nothing anybody can do about it there's nothing the devil can do about it because you came from the place of victory our insurance are born from our encounters when Mary had an encounter she would have been destroyed but because of that encounter she was preserved when Joseph wanted to put her away the angel went to him in the dream and said don't do it the child she's carrying is of the living God when you start in the flesh and the battle moves from the flesh to the spirit you become a victim if you don't have an encounter you use human wisdom when spirits come into the game you become a victim that's why you need an encounter to be truly preserved in this kingdom human philosophies are good human strategies are good but they don't make men only God makes men and when you have encounters you have insurance from the realm of Zion and finally what encounters will do for you is that encounters will guarantee a reward because when you walk by encounters you will only do what God says to do and God will only reward what he commands God will not reward your creativity your creativity is an advantage in the natural, not in heaven. In heaven, what gives you an advantage is obedience. Perfect obedience. He said to Moses, ensure to build according to the pattern that was revealed to you on the mount. That is only when the glory will rest. If you wake up and say, no, this temple, if we decide to modify, you are in trouble. So when a man begins to have encounters, there is a compass for him to follow. And because he follows that compass, he is sure that he will find reward at the end of his journey. This is why Paul said, I have run my race. I have finished my course. How did he know he finished? How can you know when you have finished? Except as it was revealed to you. He said, I have finished my course. There remained for me a crown of life. Why others are hoping they will go to heaven? Another man is not hoping. He knows he will be in heaven. And he knows what will be given to him when he goes to heaven. Because by encounters, he knew when he finished his assignment. He said, I have finished my course. When do you know that your course is finished? Except as you have encounters. So you don't do what you are not sent to do. You only do what you are sent to do and you know when you finish it. What a way to live. The Bible said, David, when he served the Lord, according to the word of the Lord, he rested with his fathers. Men know when they finish. When Jacob finished, he said, gather around me, you sons of Israel. Gather around me, you sons of Jacob. I will tell you the things that will befall you. And when he was done blessing them in Genesis 49, he packed himself and laid on the bed and slept. That means they don't die. They journey. When they finish, they journey. Because they know the assignment on earth is finished. When Elijah finished, he told them, today I'll be carried to heaven. What a way to live. You are walking on earth and then you tell somebody, today I will be carried to, today, what, excuse me sir, what are you talking about? I want to be a prophet like that. And he didn't just say today, he knew where he will be carried from. That's why the guy, the guy could afford to say, I can't bless you. You know why? He knows if he says you are blessed, you are blessed. See, you need to read the Old Testament and see the authority the fathers walked in. A man will look at his son and say, I bless you with corn and wine. I bless you with the dew of heaven. He has no regard for inflation. Whether inflation or deflation, if I bless you, you will prosper. They, they knew what they carried so much that they know when they speak, even the national economy will obey it. Elijah stood and said, by this time tomorrow, excuse me, we are talking about a national economic disaster. How dare you speak like that? And a prime minister doubted him. He said, you will see it, you will not eat of it. Ah! These men were gods. Elijah knew where he would be carried from. And he wanted to deceive Elisha. Elisha said, give me a double portion of what you carry. He said, you have asked the hard thing. 
He took him from one city to another city. Wait here. He says, so long as God lives, I will not leave you today. Because they know this man don't bluff. If he says you have it, you have it. And if he says he's going today, he's going today. And the man walked until he came to the spot where he should be carried. What an accurate way to live. Meanwhile, we are living with assumptions and presuppositions and guesses because there are no encounters. The same Jordan that God parted for over 3 million people. Elijah showed up, wrapped his mantle, hit the Jordan, he opened up. It means what God can do for 3 million, he can do for one. That means in the realm of God, the stature of one man can be equivalent to 3 million. One man can be equivalent. And meanwhile, Israel was running for their lives. Elijah was not running for his life. He was taking a stroll. And he parted the Jordan to take a stroll. <laughs> encounters will make you invincible. That's why you have to press for encounters. Press. Press. Don't live a mediocre Christian life. Everything you know should not be what Papa told you. Let God speak to you. Let God reveal himself to you. And that's not a threat to Papa. Because when you encounter God, you'll become more accurate in your service. If you are not serving a man from encounter, you are the deceiver. You are looking for opportunity to, to, to rise. You are not honest. You are not loyal. But if it is God that told you to serve, you will not serve that man. You will serve God in serving him. There are no encounters. Encounters. Meanwhile, it's important for me to add here quickly before I go to point two. That an encounter is not necessarily when an angel of light appears to you. No. It's not everybody that will have encounter by a fire burning. And God said, take off thy sandals. Here you are standing in holy ground. No. You can have encounters through the word of the Lord. The Bible said, the word of the Lord appeared to Samuel. He said, the Lord revealed himself to Samuel by the word of the Lord. In 1 Samuel 3.21. So you can have encounters reading your Bible. A scripture can come to your spirit and you know this one is for me. And you will run with it. So when I'm talking about encounter, I'm not talking about light appearing to you. It can happen. But it doesn't have to be spectacular to be spiritual. A scripture can come to you as an encounter and it will change your life forever. But by all means, you need to sustain a body. You need to seek God with all your heart. You need to learn to stand in God's presence. And you also need to learn to serve if you want encounters to become commonplace in your life. And when these things happen, your purpose, your mission on the earth will be revealed. God will become your defense. You will be empowered for destiny. And everything you need to finish your race and have a reward will be granted to you. And so, every minister making genuine impact today had an encounter and they keep having encounters. Encounters are the first requirement for the making of a genuine minister. Any noise on the earth, too many distractions, God will need to separate you to show you something. It is by that that you can run. Number two, in the making of a minister. God will take you to the mountain of instructions. The problem many people have is that they want to jump from encounter and appear in the glory. That's why they begin to cut corners and they become fake. There can be 10 apostles, we are not the same. There can be 10 prophets, we are not the same. People grow in this kingdom. It is as you grow that God lifts you. If you jump to appear, you'll be cut short. With all the encounters you've had, you'll be cut short. Hope you know 
that Samuel, after God kept appearing to him, was under a lie for a long time. He didn't just jump out and say, the word of the Lord is now with me. I'm the only person that have visions. You'll be cut off. And that's one of the major problems of the ministers of this generation. They cannot be instructed. We are too high-minded and lofty. When I started, I admire a lot of great ministers like Benihim and the rest. So when I'm going for miracle service, wear a white suit. And the Holy Ghost reminded me quickly. He said, please remember that you are not Benihim. Before you now go for a meeting and you say, the last time they brought Benihim in a chopper. So if your host doesn't bring you in a chopper, you won't go out. You will die. Benihim came for, a, came for a meeting. And then the way they welcome him, 10,000 people come to welcome him. And then you now come to a meeting and they don't receive you at the airport. And then you, your spirit is affected. You will die. He grew to that rank. So grow. You are going for a meeting. They didn't book business class. You now come to the airport. And then you come for the conference and then you are frowning with your host throughout. You will die. Because when he flies a private jet, you want to go on a private jet, you will die. If your host has the capacity to book business class, thank God, you will, have, you will be relaxed in your journey. But if he can't, manage and go. When you grow to the level of private jet, you won't ask for it. It will come naturally. You know the problem we have? We mistake admiration. Or we confuse, we replace admiration with high-mindedness. You can admire somebody and act like him. Paul said, follow me as I'm the follower of Christ. But that you admire somebody does not mean you are that person. So if you begin to make the demands that is allocated to that person, you will fall into a pit. And this is why God will carry you through the class of instructions. In the class of instructions, God wants to show you where you really are. Because it's possible for you to become lofty in your mind. It's possible for you to become high-minded. You come into a meeting. And then somebody ministers, you say, what? Is this what he's doing? I can do better than this. And then the people you should honor, you call them your colleagues. You will stop there for 20 years. It is in your old age, you will wake up and discover that in this kingdom, God lives men, not based on their gift, but based on their character and their process. So God can choose to lift a man you are more gifted than. The reason is because what God is checking is to what degree he can trust him. When you believe in God, it's called faith. When God believes in you, it's called faithfulness. God lifts men based on faithfulness. And faithfulness is a, a, a measure of God's confidence in you. That's why Paul said, exhort not a novice. A novice may, you can't trust him. And so when you see men that God leaves, the first thing you should check is not their gift. It's their process. Where are they in their work with God? And the second place God will bring you is this class of instructions. I wish I had time to tell you some of my instructions. I preached for one year, one year as a traveling minister. God told me not to touch one honorarium. That's not a doctrine now. That's my dealing. I gathered all my honorarium for one year. I went and gave my father in the law. One year. I have served three ministries. And there is no one I served less than seven years. Because God told me, you are not permitted to go anywhere until you have served for at least seven years. Because the age of service in the kingdom is seven. If you don't serve for seven years, you have no inheritance. Not today that people stumble into a ministry after two years, they stumble out. You will be like a rolling block. Because when warfare comes, you will, you will be destroyed. 
Hope you know number five is warfare. Because the weight of your calling will not be tested by your gift. The weight of your calling will be tested by warfare. Go and check the scripture. Every great calling. And so in order for you to pass warfare, God will carry you through instruction. Because there is... Thank you, sir. There is warfare ahead of you. Bishop Abiyoye said, every new level have new devils. If you don't go through the door and you appear in the class of warfare, you will be cut off. There is a realm where you are, you can preach anything, nobody will talk. There's another realm where you preach, they will go and cut five seconds out of two hours message and use that five seconds to probe your ministry. They will probe your whole ministry with a five second statement, five seconds. How can this man of God say this? And they will discredit your whole ministry based on five seconds. That topic, they don't care the topic you are talking on. They don't care the topic. They don't care even if you have a series on that topic. As far as they are concerned, you said this in five seconds. They will use it to judge your whole ministry. And your ministry can crumble because of five seconds. A speech of five seconds. It's called the class of warfare. But before you arrive there, make sure you go through the class of instructions. In the class of instructions, God will help you. God will show you where you truly are. You know, in Exodus chapter 13, from verse 17 to 18, they saw the hand of God visibly in Egypt, cut down a nation. And so, not any nation that dares, they are in trouble. <laughs> and God told them, there is warfare in front. If you see battles, you will run. I overtook Egypt for you. The next nations you meet, you will fight. And so the Bible said, God did not let them go through the way of the desert even though it was short. He said, he carried them through the way of the Red Sea. The reason is because, he said, if they go through the way of the desert and they see battles, he said, they will run back. Because they may see battles and say, where is the God that destroyed Egypt? That God will not destroy every nation. Because if he destroys every nation, the whole earth will be desolate. So after you see the mighty hand of God on the mountain of encounters, he will now take you through instructions so that you will begin to grow. And most times, the way God humbles you in the class of instruction is that he will place you under another man. You want to take the whole world. The man will look at you and say, fast for six months. Fast? I've been fasting for the last five years. The question is not fasting. It's to break you. It's to, it's to, it's to humble your heart. It's to humble you. When you are done fasting for six months, the man will now say, go and be the PA of my assistant pastor. Meanwhile, you came already with the title of apostle without ordination. You <laughs> Hope you know most of the prophets are not ordained. Are you aware? Because they, they can't serve anybody. They can't follow instruction. And because they know before they are ordained, they will need to be broken. They will just boycott it, carry their manifestation like arrows and enter the battlefield. So you have apostles that are not ordained, you have prophets that are not ordained, you have pastors that are not ordained. They woke up and they started ministry. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with it because not everybody in the Bible was ceremonially ordained. But there is something wrong with it because you didn't go through process. So I'm not saying people must lay hands on you before you start ministry. Before you quote Elijah for me. That Elijah the Tishbite went to the king. So let's not go into doctrine. <laughs> it will take us a whole week. But whether the hands are laid or hands are not laid. I know Jeremiah was ordained the prophet from his mother's womb. So you are a prophet from your mother's womb. No problem. I know all of that. Praise God. They will start. You know, when people don't want to do the right thing, they bring scriptures that support error. So the problem is not the ceremony. The problem is that there was never a time in your life 
where your character was put to test. There was never a time in your life where a presbytery sat down and said, this one has passed the test of character. He can stand and represent the body. There was never a time like that. And that will not happen until you have gone through instruction. They will give you instruction. If you study the Bible, you will hear it again and again. Joshua, God himself called him the servant of Moses. God didn't say Joshua, my servant. God said Joshua, the servant of Moses. In fact, they called him the minister of Moses. The way Moses was the minister of God, Joshua was the minister of Moses. Not because God was doing human worship, but he showed you that they are kidders. Because if you can't serve man, you can't serve God. He called him Elijah that poured water in the hands of Elijah. And I told you, as for kingdom, you will do it for at least seven years. Go and check your Bible. Everywhere there was service, they approved by seven years. Jacob served Laban for seven years to take this wife. He served for another seven years to take the second one. It is on the seventh year that you rest. It's on the seventh day that you rest. So if you have not served for seven years, you can't take an inheritance. And so God will expose you to what? The class of instruction. That's when they will tell you, this is how you answer God. This is how you do this. This is how you do that. If not, you will go out and you will raise a generation in error. Ah, he So in the class of instruction, God wants to break you. Encounters can make you high-minded. So God will ensure that you are broken. In the class of instruction, God wants to teach you obedience. Because authority in this kingdom is a function of obedience. He said when your obedience is fulfilled, then you can avenge other disobedience. So two major things that happen in the class of instruction is what? That you are broken. That's why you see a lot of ministers they are highly gifted, but you can't find the fragrance of Christ. The aroma of God is not there. The moment they begin to manifest, you see arrogance. The prophet shows up, an elderly person comes, neither. He lays hands on the elderly person. Sometimes they are cleaning his shoe. He said they are, they, are, they are respecting grace. They are respecting grace. You can't see the character of Jesus. Your shoe must not be clean for the person to be blessed. A prophet will show up and march on people because he's a man of God. He was not instructed. And if you are not instructed, the devil will have a harvest in your manifestation. You will be serving God and serving the devil at the same time. Because if the devil can't stop you, he will want you to serve God and him. That's why he came to Jesus. He couldn't stop him. But he wanted Jesus to serve him too. And Jesus said, away from him. Too many uninstructed folks in the body of Christ. So you find error everywhere. Number three is the class of service. I already began to chip into this. The class of service is what qualifies you for God to entrust something to your hands. Why the class of instruction breaks you and teaches you obedience so that you can gain authority? The class of service qualifies you for your own portion in the kingdom. Jesus was teaching and he said, if you are not faithful in another man's business, he said, who will give you yours? He said, he that is faithful in little is also faithful in much. Even though God is omniscient, God has his parameter of judging. And so God will never commit anything to your hands except as you have perfected service under the tutelage of another. 
Because if you have no record of service, you will never be correct in leadership. Leadership is not something you read in the book. Leadership is actually the certificate for good service. When a man serves correctly, is rewarded with leadership. And it's a principle in the realm of God. When you are too in a hurry to manifest and you have not served, you can't go anywhere. In service, your motive will be checked. There's no basis of checking a man's motive except in service. And so what God will do before he commits something to your hand is that he will send you somewhere to serve. While you are serving, God will check whether what you are looking for is fame. That's why today, when you find people praying, everybody will be praying in the congregation like this. But the moment you give somebody the microphone to lead the prayer, <laughs> suddenly the spirit of prayer comes on him. Because this one will be recorded on Facebook. The moment he drops the prayer, the microphone, he will go back to status quo and begin to stroll around. That's hypocrisy. You will do that for 10 years. God will be waiting for the day you want to pray. <laughs> because what you are doing is not prayer. It's showbiz. When they carry the mic, See, when you finish your gymnastics, I know you did aquatic habitat. Come back to earth and pray. The king of Zion is waiting for you. service god will prove your intentions they say go for evangelism you find 10 people 10 but when you say give a charge everybody's on suit they want to give a charge for five minutes in the in the conference and then they are quoting scriptures they are quoting scriptures malachi 3 1 matthew 4 12 they are quoting scriptures because of the momentum of the conference but when you say, let's go to the street for evangelism, you won't find anybody. So God will know that you are not interested in so winning and so establishment. You are interested in the showbiz of altar, of preaching on the altar. So you will give charge for 60 years. You will give charge for 60 years. The people that came to church yesterday, God will send them to the nations. You will still be giving charge. Because you are not interested in souls. And if you are not interested in souls, what is the point sending you? So, in service, God will check your motive. He will check you. Because there is no way he can go into your heart except as you start serving. You came, you say, Lord, I love you. They say, okay, uh, this week, mop the floor. Mop the floor. I am a prophetess. Mop the floor. I can't. Where are the ushers? You are the first usher. Ushers are not the people that stand on the door. The preacher also is an usher. All of us are ushers in different departments. And so you can finish laying hands on the sick. And there is a need to wash the toilet. There is nobody who is qualified to wash the toilet. Because you are not worshipping the toilet as a cleaner. You are worshipping the toilet as a servant of God. I was so humbled. While we were coming, there was a, a traffic at the junction before we entered. Before I said, Jack, Daddy jumped out of the car. I said, wait, wait, sir. Is, is there no protocol here? Wait. He didn't hear what I was saying. He forgot that he was the general overseer. He ran down from the car, went and corrected it. Ah. You are the senior pastor. I wanted to lower my voice and say, you are the senior pastor, sir. Can't we get somebody? He doesn't remember. And then tomorrow, you too, you say you want to be father of the land. <laughs> you will, your wilderness journey is far. It's very far. This kind of person can come to church. If there's nobody, he will sweep. He will start sweeping until others come. Meanwhile, our prophets today, 
When you come to church, you will sit down and cross your leg like this. That's why you will not have rating in Zion. Because you are a superstar. You are not a servant. And God is not looking for superstars. In the kingdom, there is one star. His name is Jesus. Every other person is a servant. And so if you can preach, if you can preach and prophesy, you should also be able to sweep. If you can be protocol, you should also be able to protocol. Because there is no leadership without service. It takes servanthood to become a leader. And so the way God checks, when, when you see God doing things with people, don't be quick to start comparing yourself. You will kill yourself. You don't know what God is seeing. That lady is singing. People are crying, falling under the anointing. You think it's about a good voice. Go and sing the same song. And see the way the angels will withdraw themselves as if you are a rebel. <laughs> Have you not seen it before? Somebody is singing a song. People are crying. And then suddenly, their eyes are closed. They are crying. You, another person collects the mic and starts singing the song and the energy goes down. The angels that were responding when one was singing quickly withdraw themselves. And then the people that, that were crying suddenly start feeling tired. They sit down and they start watching you. You are singing the same song with a better voice. But the angels don't hear your voice. They hear the incense of service that rises from your heart. This is not showbiz. This is the altar of God. And there are parameters that it weighs. I was an orator many years ago. Those days, when the organizing program, I am the MC. If I do introduction, you will laugh. You will laugh until you will start crying. You will laugh. They carry me from any ministry program. I come with my bow tie and start the work of MC. And I did that work up until 2017. When I think I've arrived, God will move me from one place to another. I will go and start from the beginning. When I think I've arrived, God will take me. When I was serving in a church, before I went to the last apostolic center where I sat, I was the teacher of foundation school. We had pioneer churches. I had pioneer churches in three different states in Nigeria. I pioneered the church in Kano. I pioneered the cell in Bukavu Barracks in Kano. I left there, I went to Wari, I pioneered a cell in the Furum Barracks. I returned to Makodi, I pioneered a church in New GRA Makodi. They now gave instruction from headquarters that every leader should go back to foundation school. The people I taught and imparted with the Holy Spirit, we sat together. When we now graduated, the senior pastor in charge of our branch now forgot to submit my record. On the graduation day, people came from the government house to attend because I was already going from place to place, giving prophetic words and praying for people. When they showed up to see me receive all the awards because I was cerebral, they didn't submit my record. Meanwhile, we were all wearing academic gown. They put us in front. When they finished calling all the awards, I didn't take one. I started sweating from every part of my face. What is the meaning of this? I didn't know it was as if sweat, the sweat could fill a container. It was coming like a river. Sweat. I tried to clean it. There's some cleaning, another one comes out. What is happening here? They now called everybody and gave them a certificate. They didn't come. When the service was over, if you touch my chest, the heat from my heart. We burn, it will burn your finger. <laughs> I wanted to rake. God now say, empty all the money in your pocket as a seed to the pastor. That was when tears came down. Because I was ready to fight. Say, empty your money as a seed quickly. I, the whole anger converted to tears. And the tears came down. Until date, 
That was it. That was when God taught me that it was not about awards, it was about reward. Men give awards, God gives rewards. You can take awards and go to hell. You won't let those ones are not in the Bible school because it tore my heart into two. It was a chisel on my soul. And I can keep giving you these things again and again and again. And so when God promotes a man, you can come and sit down. You see, is it because he has revelation? Or is it because the hidden anointing? You are you are in error. The age of a man is tied to light where he travels to. And the authority of a man is tied to his obedience. The approval of a man is tied to his service. If you don't know these three things, you will never understand what rank in Zion means. A man's age is tied to light. Because light is the dwelling of God. When a man finds light, he becomes ancient. A man's authority is tied to his obedience. Because when your obedience is complete, you avenge all disobedience. And a man's approval with God is tied to his service. He said, Moses is faithful in all of the house of God. All of these three things, you will learn it in service. That's why you find gifted men, they bring reproach to God. There's no aroma of Christ from them. They've never served. And I'm not talking about human worship, where people are mutilated, undermined, bastardized. That's what I'm saying. I'm talking service in accordance with the position of scripture. Service with the fear of the Lord, both from the leader and from the servant. When you find such, give your all. Because that's the basis for your promotion. Number four is self-denial. There are many things, I've, there's a way I would have taken this teaching, but because we have several people here, I'm just saying what we can all relate with. The proof that a man has met God is the extent to which he denies himself. John said, I must decrease and he must increase. Now, this is where ministry begins from. Everything you are doing before now, you are not giving out. You are only receiving. Encounters, you are receiving. Instructions, you are receiving. Service, you are receiving. When God brings you to a point where he begins to demand self-denial, it means God wants you to begin to give out. And the only way you can give out correctly is when you deny yourself. If you don't know how to deny yourself, you can never represent God. You will end up representing yourself. A man who's a man actually starts ministry. You know, people say they start ministry when they start an organization. That's not when you start ministry. You don't start ministry when you register with your corporate affairs commission. And then you start a new wine apostolic international ministry. That's not when you start ministry. You start ministry when you start self-denial. Because the structure of ministry is number one, to glorify God. Number two, to improve the life of men. And then number three, to come into a comfortable place. But people revert the order. They want comfort. They don't care about people. They don't care about God. So they may have a title, but they are not ministers of God. A minister of God glorifies God, make people discover their destiny and realize it before he thinks of comfort. But only self-denier can teach you this. If you don't know self-denier, you will never know this. Because when God wants to commit ministry to your hand, there are two questions he will ask you. The first is in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 22. And it's in John chapter 21 verse 15 to 17. He said, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me more than this? He said, Lord, you know. He said, feed my lamb. He asked him again, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me more than this? That means yourself and everything you can gain. He said, Lord, you know I do. 
He said, keep my sheep. And he asked him the third time, Simon, son of Ajona, lovest thou me more than this? And Peter became offended. He said, Lord, you know, we've given up everything for you. That means what God considers before he sends you, he sent denial. If there's no self-denial in you, you cannot be sent by God. You may be called, but you may never be sent. There's a difference between a calling and a sending. Many people have a calling and they jump into ministry. A calling is an invitation to discipleship. You don't represent God when you are called. You represent God when you are sent. In Mark chapter 3 verse 14, he said he called them to be with him so that he can send them. And the only time God can send you is when he can trust that you have understood self-denial so that your life will mirror only Christ. When a man doesn't know self-denial, he thinks himself. And the two ways God checks for self-denial is number one, your love for God. And John, Peter, Paul came to summarize it in 1 Corinthians 16, 22. He said, if a man love not the Lord Christ, he is anathema maranatha. You know what the church does? They remove anathema and they preach maranatha because we are selfish. There's no maranatha. There's nothing like maranatha in the Bible. What you have in the Bible is anathema maranatha and it's a warning. It's not Lord come, Lord come. No, that's half truth. It means if you don't love God, you are accost waiting for the coming of the Lord. So what it's saying is that in the, in the temple, when a vessel is cursed, the priest doesn't touch it. They put it somewhere as an accursed product. So what he's saying is that a man who doesn't love God is an accursed product. So God will keep him on the shelf waiting for the coming of Christ. That means it's a state where your fate has not been decided. But the church removed the whole, changed the whole context and began to preach Maranatha. Oh, come Lord. Oh, come Lord. <laughs> The prayer is not come, Lord. If you want God to come, take the gospel of the kingdom to all the earth. That's how you bring God, by preaching the kingdom to all the earth. There's no prayer in the Bible that, Lord, come fast. No. If you want God to come, preach the gospel in all the earth. But that particular scripture is saying, if you don't love God, you are cursed. And so God can use you. And because God cannot use you, God will put you on the shelf until he comes. So that they will decide whether to cast you to hell or to judge you with mercy. So if a man doesn't love God and demonstrate it through self-denial, as the Bible said in Revelation 2.15, he will spew you out of his mouth because you are neither hot nor cold. The second thing that shows that you have entered self-denial is that you love others as you love yourself. Ministry today, they use men. You see a man of God saying, my son, my son, is because he's bringing him honor and glory and seed. They use men. And that's why young ministers cannot rise in this generation. They cut them off. A man of God will prophesy that you will fail. He will go back and engineer your failure. And then he will come back and say, God dealt with him. It's a lie. I've been here for a while. <laughs> you don't know what is happening. When you are singing the praise of the man of God, they project you. So that you will sing the praise because by doing that, others will follow. And it doesn't matter whether you talk about Jesus. Hail him so much so that everybody see him as a God. You are a choice son. The day you choose truth, you become an enemy. And they will cut you off. Ministry today, they use members. The man will preach 30 messages in one year. 29 is about giving. Even if he's preaching about repentance, he will end it with giving. Meanwhile, this giving, this giving, he doesn't preach it in a way that makes you love God. He preaches it in a way that you become carnal. Because our whole preaching on giving is give, it shall be given unto you. 
That's our whole preaching on giving. So people bargain with God when they give. They have no relationship. The more people give, the more carnal they become. And that's why criminals today are also bringing their money to church. And they are prospering. That's why they are coming. If they are not prospering, they won't come. But in the New Testament context, under the New Covenant, you don't give for it to be given to you. You are already blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Your giving in the New Covenant context is number one, because you love God. He said, where a man's treasure is, that is where his heart is. So when you give to God, you are making a statement that you love him. That's why they don't need to preach you into giving. You have already given yourself to God. So everything you have already is God's. So you don't need to be preached into giving. When people are preaching to giving, it means they know. Even the pastor knows they don't love God. Where people love God, you don't need to preach them into giving. Because where a man's treasure is, his heart is there. That's why he puts his treasure there. Number two, the reason you give in the New Testament is because you honor God. You don't give to your father to give you. You know your father loves you too much not to give you. So when you return to the father, it's a token of honor. And that's why you give your best. You give your best because your giving in the New Testament is a statement of honor to the father. Number three, you give in the New Testament because you know advancing the kingdom is your responsibility. Because you are a son. A son bears the responsibility of the kingdom. And so you know that there is a need in the house of God and in the territory that the kingdom must be advanced. And so whether they announce a conference or announce a program or not, when money comes to you, you take a portion to the kingdom. When Barnabas gave, they didn't say, come and give. He knew that there was a burden in the house. There was a kingdom to be advanced. So without any announcement, he sold his land, sold his property, brought the money to the apostles' feet. I know you have some things you need to do. I know God is saying something. I know there's an assignment. In case there's no assignment, keep it until there's one. That's a song. You don't need to come and tell him, if you give, you have a hundredfold. And out of his self-centeredness, he gives for a hundredfold. Not because he loves God. Not because he honors God. Not because he's interested in the kingdom. That's a babe. Number four, you give because your giving is an act of faith. That you trust God, not yourself. Because there are many people who trust their salaries. There are many people who trust their savings. So when we give in the New Testament, it's a faith declaration that we know God is our supplier. I know I work, but my salary can't sustain me. And go and check what you spend in one month. You'll discover that the list is three times greater than your salary. Your salary is not your sustainer. So when you give, you are making a statement in the spirit. I trust God more than what I do. It's God that lifts me up. And finally, when we give, we give so that there's equity. That's why in the early church, they say there's none among them that lacked. When the widow is above 60 years old, they look out for their needs and help them. When people can't pay school fees, they look out for them and help them. Not leeches that take advantage now. Don't get me wrong. People that have need indeed, they help them so that the church can be balanced. In fact, when you study about tight, even the tight administration in the Old Testament during the law, this is one of the purpose. The Bible said, you have robbed me and you have robbed the nation. You know why? Because when the, the high priest collects the tight, there are two things the high priest is supposed to do. Number one, he's supposed to take the tight of tight, which is the tenth portion. The 10% of the 10% that was given to him is called the heave offering. He's supposed to offer it to God as sacred. And then the remaining 90% of the tithe, he is supposed to make food available in the house so that the other Levites who are also priests will have food to eat. But today, the high priest takes everything for himself and buy a Lamborghini. The tithe of tithe doesn't go to God. 
and every other minister is a beggar. High priest is wearing a watch of $50,000. High priest is wearing Gucci from head to toe and is driving four Rolls Royce. Meanwhile, when you check the assistant pastor, he's looking like a beggar who is still trusting God for mercy. That's why today they are fighting Titan. They say, no, this thing is it. Because they say, you have robbed me and you have robbed the nation. Part of the tithe is supposed to be used for social service. Because the church is supposed to be the first model of philanthropy to society. But 100% of the tithe goes to the pocket of the high priest. Because he's a thief. That's why he preaches, if you don't give, you won't go to heaven. Because he has budgeted for a land. <laughs> He has budgeted. There, there are budgets. There are family budgets that he needs to meet. Every other pastor is broke and dying. But the high priest has more than enough. Three of his sons are in England. They go for holidays and come back. They are booking British Airways on first class. $3,500. To and fro, $7,000. Convert that to your polar. And see what three sons go on holiday for. So when you see the assistant pastor, Papa, Papa, it's not respect, it's hunger. <laughs> because when you do enough, when you do Papa well enough, they will drop some crumbs for you. That's the church where we are. We don't love, we don't love the brethren. We don't love the sheep. So, in the realm of God, we are hirelings. So, ministers today exploit the members. People give and become godless. They don't honor God. So long as they throw their money at God. They don't love the kingdom. They don't care about the advancement of God's kingdom. There's no faith in what they do. So, we manipulate people with messages. If you love the people, you will be more interested in their soul. I know how giving works. A thief can give and prosper. It's a universal law. But he will give until he dies and go to hell. So don't threaten people and say, no, you don't see. Tell them the truth. Because it's the truth that makes free. Why do you think your politicians come when there are programs? And they give and go away. They know that what they are giving is prospering them. Because if it doesn't, they won't give. It's not even something you argue doctrinally. Most of the thieves, the criminals in my country, there are many Yahoo boys that give to many churches. They know they are prospering. That's why they are giving. If they are not prospering, they won't give. They give to the poor. They give to church. They will prosper. It's universal. But they will go to hell. And so when you are interested in them, you will tell them the implication that this giving won't save their soul until they know God. Stop their evil and submit to God. If you love people, listen, the target of a man of God should be how many percentage of his members can stand with him in Zion. Paul said he lifts this man as an offering to God. The goal of a man of God is to see that by the grace of God, let everyone make eternity with him. Jesus said, all that you've given to me, have not lost anyone except the son of perdition, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. That's the goal of a man of God. That when I go to heaven, in the world to come, everyone that followed me will make it. Let no one be left behind. That's why you will kneel down at night and pray. Pray for every member to be established. Paul said, my little children of whom I travail in prayer. Do you know what travail is? They are the groanings of a woman who is about to give birth. Can you pray like that for another person? That's what it means to be a minister. That means if Paul sees that you are falling, Paul will take your name to the altar and he will groan over you until you are standing. In Colossians 4.12, he says, Papharas is one of you a born servant of Christ, laboring fervently for you in prayers that you will stand perfect. That means if the, if the members are fornicating, the fault belongs to the pastor. 
because he has not travelled over them. Jesus said, Simon, Simon, Satan desires to have you, to sift you as wheat. He said, but I have prayed for you that your faith faileth not. He said, when thou art recovered, strengthen thy brethren. Paul said, when I leave you, wolves shall come. That means why Paul was there, nobody could fall. But today, they don't love anybody. Man of God is praying for visibility, praying for acceptance. The whole church is praying for pastor, but pastor never prays for the church. And so you come into a church, it's a band of fornicators, liars, criminals. So long as the pew is full, pastor shows up and says, praise God. God is good to us. To who? Where thieves and wolves are hiding under the covering of the church. We are not ministers. We are professional preachers. When we start ministry, the sign will be self-denial. If you find your members in crisis, you will lose your sleep. That's when you are a shepherd. You are not a shepherd because you know the doctrines of the Bible. You are a shepherd because you help others to stand. And to stand perfect in all the will of God. That's why self-denial is important. These are our pastors today that go to club. Are those the kind of pastors that know ministry? Pastors that compete with celebrities. They literally compete with celebrities on wearing designers and driving Porsche cars. Buying lands on islands. Thinking only pleasure. Where would that pastor have time to kneel down and travel for people? It's a body. We have no ministers. A generation is hungry for God, but there are no ministers. There are no ministers. You come to a man of God with hunger. After two years, he turns you to a manipulator. The Bible said concerning the Pharisees, Jesus rebuking them. He said, you travel land and sea to make a proselyte. That's a disciple, a, an early disciple. He said, after a while, you turn him twice to the son of the devil. That's what goes on. So members are trying to, to lie, to cover their pastors. Because they know, both of them know that the pastors are people of iniquity. And they have become so darkened in their heart that their fight is to protect man of God. Witchcraft of all sorts. And so if you want to be a minister, ministry does not begin when you register the name of your church. Ministry begins from the platform of self-denial. If you have not been able to deny self, don't carry the cross of ministry. It will kill you and it will kill others. You can have a church for 10 years, you are not in ministry. You are just there trying to prepare your retirement benefit. That's nothing to do with God. Because when you are in ministry, God will be glorified and people will be established. And so when you want to find a, the strength of a minister don't be moved by the size of his congregation when you come to that church go to the ushering unit talk to the people, find out if they know God go to the choir, find out if they know God come and sit at the back, hear what the people are saying hear what the members are saying you will know whether they know God I read about E.W.K. in his church. They brought a hidden evangelist. Walk out miracle. He showed up in a meeting. And when he prayed for the sick, he called for testimony. Nobody came out. And he was, have I lost my anointing? What is happening? They now tapped him and said, no, your anointing is intact. There's no sick person here. The man had taught them eternal life until, because he's not a superstar. He doesn't need to use healing to shine. He taught them how to use the word of God for themselves. Nobody was sick there. 
Everybody is standing. That's a minister. It will take labor. That's why Paul said, I labor more than them all. That labor is not God prosper me. It's not God anoint me. It's God keep these people. Let them stand. Let them stand. I want genuine men to rise from Zimbabwe. When my day is past, let it be on record that I raised 50 men that stood for Jesus. Let it be on record that I raised 100 men that stood for Jesus. Those were their, their cries. And that's why Paul recommended such men. He said, Epaphras is laboring night and day that you may stand perfect. No self-denier. We use the altar to rob people and to rob God. And we say we are ministers because we have bogus titles. Our time is fast spent. This is 2 p.m. I would have spoken a bit about warfare. A bit about warfare. You know, this evening is a revival service. We won't talk like this. Oh. <laughs> we won't talk like this. You see, there are those the devil fights and there are those the devil uses. There are two different things. The devil doesn't fight everybody. There are some he's using. And when the devil is using you, he will steal from you, he will kill you, and he will destroy you. So some of the people you see being publicly embarrassed is not warfare. The devil have used them to a point where it has boomerang. So don't call your business and transaction with the devil a warfare. If the devil uses you as a thief for a long time and he's done with you and he recruits another student and he doesn't need you anymore, he won't do the same for party he will do for you is that he will lead you into public ridicule. Now don't come back and start telling people that that public ridicule is warfare. It's not warfare. Your, your bargain with the devil is finished. That's how he coronates those he uses. Before I start talking and you now start pointing at people that it's not warfare. It's not everything that is warfare. The people the devil fights are those that have gone through the college of self-denial. Those are the ones the devil comes to. If you study Matthew chapter 4, he came to Jesus. And when the devil comes to you, he checks first to find out if there is anything in you that fights to defend you. If you can't find anything, then he will know that you are a threat to his kingdom. Because if there is something the devil can bargain with you on, it means you are not a threat. He will use you. But when he finds that there is nothing in you, then you are a threat. That is when he will start fighting you. Because the devil comes to men first before he fights them. The ones he finds something in, he doesn't fight them. He negotiates with them. But when he can't negotiate with you, then he will fight you. So warfare is not for everybody. Warfare is for those who pass the class of self-denial. And there are three things the devil will fight in the last day. The first thing the devil will fight in the last day is your name. Because asset in this kingdom is not car and land. Asset in this kingdom is the level of influence you are able to wield in the spirit. That influence impacts the realm of men. And one of the signatures of that influence is the name that you have. That's why he said a good name is to be desired more than silver and gold. It is God himself that gives name to men. And the name God gives men is not for nomenclature's sake. It is based on the doors they can unlock, based on the scepter they carry, and based on the purpose that they are pregnant with. And so when he came to Abraham, he said, you shall no longer be called Abraham, but you shall be called Abraham. Abraham is assumed father. Your purpose is that you'll be father of nations. And so you can't be an assumed father. You have to be a father indeed. 
So he gave him that name. When he looked at Peter, he said, Simon, son of Bajona, you shall be called Peter because you have to be a rock as the leader of the first church. So when the devil comes, what he wants to do is to rubbish your name. So he will look for things to deceive men. Because when your name is affected, it becomes difficult for you to advance kingdom because it's all about kingdom. He has checked you out and discovered you are not in this for yourself. So he will try to stop you from advancing the kingdom. So he will start attacking your name. If you study the book of Revelation, the beast, the, the, the creatures that came out of the water, you will see the assignment. This is one of it. They want to dent your name. So you may have the right message, but nobody will hear it. So you are not the one who is robbed. The people are the ones who are robbed. They will not know. And so because of the people, what you will do is to fight to preserve it. Don't be careless. Some of you have a name that imparts righteousness. When they call you, everything about you represents righteousness. Don't allow the devil to deceive you into something that is unrighteous. Some of you, the name you have in the spirit imparts the fear of God. When you come to a place, people tremble at God's presence. Don't do anything that will violate it. Because when I'm talking about a name now, I'm not talking about the politics and gimmicks of trying to appear good before men. No, it's not about men. It's about Zion. Because you will not be accused among men by the devil. It's in Zion. The devil will fight it. So your greatest warfare will be around you. But the way you protect your name is not through manipulation. It's not through canvassing for support. The way you fight to keep your name is to stand before God and to plead the blood constantly. He will do everything around it. But if you stand before God and plead the blood, nothing he does can affect it. Because if you are not careful in a bid to defend your name, you will now go into error. You now start looking for people to support you, looking for people to accept with you, trying to explain yourself. Relax. Jesus said, Woe unto you, for men speak good of you. Don't be moved. Just stand before God. He said, They looked up to him, and their faces were radiant, and they were not ashamed. The second thing the devil will fight. This is warfare I'm talking about. Warfare from kingdom context. Are the men that God sent to you? He will fight to corrupt their heart. Hope you know that every Moses will have an Aaron and a Hor. Every David will have a mighty man. If those men are disconnected from you, the weight and the impact of your ministry and your calling will go down. And so when the devil fights, he fights to corrupt the heart of those men. And again, your job is not to manipulate them or win their favor. That's not your job. Your job is to live a life of righteousness before them. That's all you need to do. Don't, don't manipulate men to follow you. Because there are some men that God will tell them to go and do something else. His kingdom. Don't hail men while they are with you. And the moment they leave, you begin to paint them black. Because there are some people, you are a good man so long as you follow them. The moment God tells you something else, you become a bad man. So one day they can call you a, a, an angel. The next day they call you a devil. Go and check. They called you an angel when you were serving them. The day you no longer serve them, become a devil. Don't do that. That's manipulation. There are men that God will send to do other things. When, when a man serves you and God decides to lift him to do something else, the credit goes to you. Because in the kingdom, you raised him. And he can never become anything without you in this kingdom. And so when you try to destroy him because of sentiment, insecurity, and ego, 
you are destroying what you built with your hand. Even if that person makes a mistake, your job is to help him stand. Because what it becomes is part of your reward in Zion. That's why when Lot left Abraham and nations came to destroy Lot, Abraham didn't sit down and say, well, he thought, I thought he said he too is a strong man. Let him suffer it. He was with me here doing good. Suddenly he said he's also grown. Let him. No, Abraham had the heart of a father. The Bible said Abraham took 318 trained servants of his house. He went and fought those kings, put his life in trouble for Lot. And when Abraham defeated those kings, he didn't take Lot back. He said, go and fulfill your destiny. It was on Abraham's return from that journey that he met Melchizedek. That was when the greatness of Abraham started. The greatness of Abraham did not start when he gave birth to Isaac. No, the greatness of Abraham started when he gave birth to Lot. Because when he delivered Lot from death, that was when Lot was born again. And when God saw that, Melchizedek appeared to Abraham. And that was the day he called Abraham possessor of heaven and earth. Abraham did not possess earth because he gave birth to Isaac. Abraham possessed earth because he went to deliver Lot, even though he looked as if Lot betrayed him. So there are many people today that their rank in the kingdom will reduce because they fought the people that once served them. And there are many people that their rank will increase because they help the people that serve them to stand, whether they are with them or they are not with them. That's the difference between an elder and a father. Because when the prodigal son left, the father never let go of him from his heart. He said, my son was once dead. Now he's back to life. He was not forgiven when he came back. He was forgiven while he was away. That's why the father didn't wait for apology. And I'm not saying this for sons to become radical. Because the, a son honors his father. That's what makes you a genuine son. Honor. So don't do what is wrong and say, if they are fathers, they'll forgive us. That's not the message. Are we together? But the point I'm trying to make is that the devil will come to fight the men that God has given to you. If it's God that tell them, allow them. That's how you become great. You become great because many tribes come out of you. Some will be Isakas that have a prophetic heritage. Some will be Judas that have the heritage of, of, of kingship. Some will be Levites that have the heritage of priesthood. So there are many tribes. So when the tribes are spreading, leave them. They may not even call your name but they carry your DNA in the spirit. And so when the devil wants to fight you, he will fight the men that follow you. But what you need to do, don't try to use politics. Don't try to use witchcraft. So long as you have displayed righteousness, let it be. If they are wrong, God will judge. Because if you are not careful, you who was an accurate minister, you will drift into witchcraft. And you want to win the approval of men and the sentiment of men, you will be deranked in heaven. Rick Joyner told the story, those of you who have read the final quest, of a man he met in heaven. He was deranked because of what he did to younger people. That's why the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. So when the devil is fighting you through the men that are under you, encourage yourself in the Lord and keep going the way of righteousness. That's all. Paul said to Timothy, he said, the things you have seen in me, do. The things you have seen. That means Paul was not just a preacher. He demonstrated righteousness. I'm telling you how we fight kingdom battles. Because if you are corrupt, the people around you will be vulnerable. There are many ministers that sow bitterness into the heart of their followers. They don't know that they are planting evil in their soul. Don't do that. Just live righteously and leave the rest to God. Those who are your own will be with you. And they will become great tribes that will come out of you. That tribe is what the devil is afraid of. 
because he knows that different tribes carry different scepter and he doesn't want that and number three what the devil will fight are your resources because kingdom is spread abroad through resources and so the devil wants to truncate your resources cut it off If you are able to survive self-denial, you will survive this warfare. The reason many people fail in warfare is because they didn't pass self-denial. Because when warfare comes, you will start fighting to protect yourself. No. It is in warfare that the faithfulness of God is proven in your life. So when the devil is fighting you, that's the time to rely on God. The more you try to protect yourself, the more you go down. It's like standing in the mud. Don't struggle. If you start struggling, you start sinking. Just leave yourself in the hands of God and watch God carry you. Watch God carry you. You will trust God a way you have never trusted Him. In warfare, we don't fight. In warfare, we yield to God. We fight by yielding. That's why I say submit to God. And by submitting to God, you resist the devil. If you don't submit to God and you start resisting the devil, you will fail. Because you will deploy the energy of flesh. Genuine ministers, they fight battles every day. But they win those battles in the presence of God. They don't win the battle on Facebook. They don't win it on YouTube. They win it in the presence. I'm telling you this because it will happen. Unless you are not growing. If you are growing, expect warfare. Every level you get to, there will be battles. But the summary of these battles will have to do with your name in the spirit, your men, and your resources. Because the devil knows if he cuts this off you, you can never advance the kingdom, no matter how anointed you are. And this is why you have to pray for ministers. Because they are fighting battles that are greater than them. The battles they fight is not their size. Is the size of their purpose. And their purpose is usually greater than them. Warfare. They say with gift, we shake the world, we character, we preserve it. 
Did not use a gift to shake your world. Check your country. There are many people with word of knowledge. They are nowhere. There are many people with healing. They are nowhere. What you use to shake your world is a horn. A man who has a horn is different from a man who has a gift. A horn is a scepter in the spirit. The grace that shakes the world is a horn. That's why I said, My horn shall thou exhort like the horn of the unicorn. He said, You shall anoint me with fresh oil. When a man passes, oh, there's an anointing here now. Because when you come here, the realm begins to open. You see, you can have word of knowledge, you can have gifts of healing. But when God wants you to affect your nation, what he does is that he exhorts your horn. This time around, you are not manifesting a gift. You are manifesting the influence of God. That horn can cause presidents to bow. That horn will cause principalities. Hear me. Let me tell you the difference. If you have a gift, you will affect men as circumstances. But when you have a horn, you affect spirits. If I have the gift of healing, I can pray for the sick and they will be healed. But I can pray for a thousand sick people and the nation will not be affected. But if I have a horn that manifests as a miraculous horn, when I'm operating, I'm not only healing the sick, the princes that guard against sickness, I will uninstall them from that realm. It is my power to deal with those princes that will cause the gates to open to me. Because there is a man who is operating by a gift in a city. But there's another man that the gate of the city opens to. One of them has a gift. The other has a horn. There are many of you here that there is a horn that should be exalted like the horn of the unicorn. But you have not passed through self-denial. You have not passed through warfare. And so you are using your gift and you are trying your best. No. Wait for the horn to grow. When the horn grows, the nations will open. The gate to the city will open. The door will open. Everywhere you come, you become an ambassador of Zion. You become a custodian of a mystery. You become an envoy of the kingdom. God is raising for men that have arms. That, what, that, we, that is what we call the realm of grace. Because many people can have gifts. But only those with exalted horns can take the nations. Ah. Oh my God. I can sense the fragrance. I can sense the fragrance. You see, the, anoint the anointing will seep into this place now. And so, ushers, what you will do is that as the Lord begins to touch them, bring them to the altar. Nobody will pray for them. Just put them on the altar. Yeah. We lift up voices and cry. Sing it. finances and they deal with princes 
in the mammon realm. They are those that have horns in government. That's why you can come to one church. There are 12 senators. The president goes there. It's not because of a message. He's a horn. He's a disciple of government. He has power in the corridors of government. And there are those that have a horn on the altar. They are placed in priest's home. There are different horns that are growing this morning. And as I speak by the spirit, every horn that you carry, the grace to cause that horn to grow. Receive it now. You never leave me. You say that you won't forsake me. You walk beside me. And that is all that matters. Has happened up. There's someone smiting. And the moon needs to know nothing. The flood will sweep me. The Lord is my alcohol. You are the covenant keeping God. Say, you are the covenant keeping God. Somebody say, you are. You are the covenant keeping God. But one of you are the covenant keeping God. You are the covenant keeping God. You are the covenant keeping Southern Africa, 
it will affect the whole of Africa because the Lord raises men with horns in the spirit. You are mighty on your throne. Lord, you reign, you reign, you reign, you reign. And it's outside. <laughs> when you find people running around, they don't know ministry. When you stay with God and God exalts your heart, you may not be a preacher. You will be praying as an intercessor. That mountain where you are praying, people will come from, from Asia to come and see you there. People will come from the United States. Even when you are long gone, that mountain will become a pilgrimage center. Not because you preached. You were just there praying. But as you are praying, your horn is rising. And the impact of that horn will affect the universe. There is gimmicks and manipulation because men don't know ministry. You can be here in South Africa. Southern Africa in Botswana. People will travel from the United Kingdom every year to come and sit at your feet to hear what you have to say. Can you pray for one minute that your horn may be exalted? Your horn. Your horn. Oh, my God. Holy Ghost. When you are dead, when you are dead, when you are dead, when you are, when you are dead, when you are dead, when you are dead, when you are dead, when you are, when you are dead, when you are dead, when you are dead, when you are, when you are dead, you are dead, when you are dead, when you are dead, when you are. When you are there, you are there. When you are there, when you are there, when you are there. Hear this. When the spirit wants to exalt you, he exalts your heart. There's a woman in my country called Ngozi Okonjoy Wella. She's so exalted. She was working as finance minister. They wanted to ridicule her and remove her. The moment they removed her, the moment World Bank came back begging because she was in World Bank before. Now she's the chairman of one of the world's economic summit. She's bigger than Nigeria. She's bigger than Africa. She occupies global positions. So when that kind of woman comes to, to help Nigeria, when the spirit exalts your heart. Men will gather that they want to fight you in Botswana. Then God will carry you. And you will start talking to Africa. Like fire. Like rain. Let your glory fall. Like fire. Like rain. Let it fall. Yeah. Like fire. Like rain, let your glory 
before coming for the evening session. Something will break in the atmosphere. Something will break. My soul has not ascended since I came. My soul. But I'm trusting the Lord that in the evening you know there is an oil that flows when utterance comes. You, you can taste it like honey. I'm waiting for that oil. When I sense it, something will break in this place. You will never be the same again. Some of you, he will exhort your horn in economy. Some of you, he will exhort your horn in government. Some of you, he will exhort your horn in media. Because ministers are not just preachers. Ministers can be government officials. They can be economic giants. In the name of Jesus, the grace that grows horns, receive it now. If you were blessed by this message you just listened to, and you wish to make Jesus your Lord and personal Savior, kindly repeat the prayer after me. Dear Heavenly Father, I believe in your Son, Jesus Christ, and that He died for my sins and was raised from the dead for my justification. I therefore confess with my mouth that Jesus is the Lord of my life. I receive eternal life into my spirit. I am born again. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. If you just said this prayers, please send us an email at info at encounterjesusministry.org or info.ejmi.ng at gmail.com. You can also visit our website at www.encounterjesusministry.org.